there are three meninges. The dura mater, or hard mother. Okay, it's hard. Okay, and it completely surrounds the brain. You can imagine that the brain is totally encased in dura. All the way around the brain, all the way down the spinal cord, it is encased in dura. And the function of the dura is protection. I'm making this real easy. The function of the dura is to protect the brain from anything coming from the outside. Okay. The next meningi is the pia mother, or soft mother. See that tissue right there? Okay, imagine that completely surrounding the brain. Now, I've peeled it off so that you can see down into the sulci and see the gyri, but it is completely surrounded. So now you have the entire brain and spinal cord covered with a layer of tissue, the pia, that surrounds the whole brain. Cerebral spinal fluid can't get through the pia, and cerebral spinal fluid can't get through the dura unless there's a break. It's trapped between those two. So you now have, between the dura and the pia, the brain actually floating in cerebral spinal fluid. Right. Now, the third meningene, and there's a little bit of it left, See this kind of spider web-like stuff? Yeah. That is called the arachnoid, okay? Latin, spider, arachnoid. That completely surrounds the brain, too. And what that does is since you have the dura, it allows the dura to move just a little bit. So the brain can actually... Can I have everyone's attention, because this is the first time I've decided to say this part. Um, the arachnoid, you've got the dura and the pia and the arachnoid in between. Now remember, do you want the brain to be able to have a little bit of give? Well, what happens is the brain can move a little bit underneath the dura because the arachnoid gives. Okay, so there's a, you can have some movement. So the brain isn't stuck. It can actually move a little. And we want it to be able to move a little. How come? Yeah, well, there's blood, but you also, if you hit your head, if you break rule number one, it's acting kind of like a shock absorber. Okay, the guys all know about this. You know, uh, a gas shock or a fluid shock absorber. That's why, you remember when I broke rule number one? You know, I came up here and I went, uh, Okay, now I didn't hurt myself. How come? Number one, I have cerebral spinal fluid completely surrounding my brain. It can move a little underneath the dura because of the arachnoid, and my brain just kind of went, ee, ee, ee. Uh, so, so well, it, it's no, it allows the brain to move a little underneath the, uh, the dura. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now you have the arachnoid, and the arachnoid is the third meningi, and it completely covers the brain. It's like web-like all the way around, and that's for protection, too. So when I have a pin in the dura, just say, dura mater, protection. When I have a pin in, uh, when I have a pin in the pia, that's pia mater, protection. When I have a pin in the arachnoid, you just say, arachnoid, protection. <laughs> okay. You ought to be able to get all that, okay? Any questions about the, the membranes, the meninges? Okay, now this is a wonderful, wonderful specimen. Here we have the lateral ventricles. Remember, there are four ventricles. You have a right lateral ventricle, a left lateral ventricle, and inside the ventricles, see this tissue right there? That's called the plexus. And you have choroid plexus in the lateral, third, and fourth ventricle. This is what is producing cerebral spinal fluid. It's basically extracting cerebral spinal fluid out of the blood. And the mechanism, I don't know. Um, I'd have to read and see what it is. Okay, so now I start filling up the lateral ventricle with cerebral spinal fluid. 
and it starts filling up the posterior horn and the temporal horn and the anterior horn. Now, what's the consistency of this thing? No, I'm talking about the brain itself. Jello. What's going to happen if I don't let that out of there? It's going to start pushing the brain back towards the skull, and since the skull is hard and fairly immovable, the brain's going to start squishing against it, and you're going to start killing tissue. So what you have to do is you got to let it out. Now, I've cut this brain in half, so it starts to fill up the lateral ventricle. And see the little hole right there? That is the inner ventricular foramen. And the inner ventricular foramen is the hole that connects the lateral ventricles to the third ventricle. Then if you look at this area right here, now that we've come out and you see some arachnoid or some cord plexus sticking out there through the hole, see this area right in here? And this is so pretty. It looks like, it looks like a little bathtub. Mm -hmm. That's the third ventricle. And what has happened is I have cut down through that thing. This used to be together. Here's the third ventricle. I've cut down, and you are now looking at the side of the hole. Okay? So I fill up the third ventricle, and you can see the third ventricle. It goes down here around the, the lateral walls, or excuse me, the medial walls of the hypothalamus. This is the thalamus right there. It starts to fill up this hole. I've got to get out of there. So now where am I going to go? Well, I've got to get down. Remember, it's being produced mostly up here. Gravity and pressure is going to start percolating it down. I've got to get out, and I go through the little river. See the little river right there going down through the mesencephalon? There's the mesencephalon. These are, the, these are the colliculi, the superior and the inferior colliculus. So right here, through the medial parts of the mesencephalon, actually it's more dorsal, but that's a joke. I go down here, and I fill up this little diamond-shaped area called the fourth ventricle. From the fourth ventricle, it will continue right on down the central canal. You can kind of almost see this one. See the hole right there? The cerebrospinal fluid will go all the way down the spinal cord through what's called the central canal. So you've got cerebrospinal fluid completely on the inside. Here at the level of the fourth ventricle, there is a hole outside that gets you onto the outside of the pia, which allows cerebrospinal fluid to now move between the pia and the dura. So now I've got cerebrospinal fluid completely surrounding the brain because it fills up. And now I've got the brain completely full of cerebrospinal fluid. I've got cerebrospinal fluid between the dura and the pia. The arachnoids allowing the brain to move just a little underneath the dura. And then I've got to get it out of there because what's going to happen if I don't get it out of there? It will continue to fill up and fill up and fill up. And you don't, and it will start putting pressure on the brain from here. So, the superior sagittal sinus. Okay, superior means top. Sagittal is this mid sagittal section. And there it is. Right there. I'm in that hole in the middle now. There's the superior sagittal sinus. The arachnoid granulations. And you can't see them. There aren't any here. They're kind of hanging down out of this fort, or out of this superior sagittal sinus, and it reuptakes cerebral spinal fluid. It's recirculated through the venous blood back to the choroid plexus through the arterial blood. Yes. So it doesn't have like encephalitis. Is that an excess of cerebral spinal fluid? No, encephalitis is an infection of the encephalon. So if you have an infection on the tissue itself, that's encephalitis. What do infections do? They cause swelling. Yes. So all the Yes. Okay. Okay. And so encephal encephalitis would be an infection on the surface of the brain or inside the brain itself. What would what would be meningitis? Oh, meningitis. That's right. 
Yeah, and usually you'd have some infection on the PMI. So encephalitis is an infection of the brain. Meningitis is an infection on the meninges. Both of those causing swelling, which is going to put pressure on our thing that's about the consistency of jello. Not good. Any questions? Pretty cool, huh? Now, can I have everybody's attention again? I'm going to do this one more time, then I'll go around and see if you have some specific questions. Uh, it was about 20 years ago I was giving this lecture, this very lecture, on cerebrospinal fluid. And one of my students got up, finished the class, walked out of the class, this wasn't here, if you were in Hawaii, walked out of the class, got about 50 yards away from class, and passed out. And what had happened is the cerebral spinal fluid had become somewhat granular and clogged up the interventricular foramen. Oh. And so his ventricles were getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and pushing down on the brain stem. The lookout centers, look out! And the vital function. He got about 50 yards down from the class and goes, you know, I really don't feel very good. And down he went. So they got the paramedics, got him over to the hospital. And what they will do to fix that is they will push a shunt right through here and then leak and, and let the cerebrospinal fluid leak out. <laughs> is there permanent brain damage? Pardon? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. But any, like, really noticeable, like, well, not the thing correct. Yeah, there, there, there will be no, anytime you start pushing things through the brain, you're going to hurt them. Yeah. But, uh, but if they hadn't pushed it through, it would die. So, you know, you, you're way but I thought that was really interesting. Right after this lecture, I had a student go down with hydrocephalus. Oh, can you die? Oh, absolutely. If they hadn't gotten into the hospital quickly, he would have died. What's rule number one? Okay, one last. I'll, I'll do this one more time, and then I'll just come around and see if you have some.